I thought about your question, uh, and when we talk about aesthetics in the broader sense, um, what what I think narrows it down is the, is the catechesis. That's it's not all of everything aesthetical, but the the things that we perceive aesthetically that catechizes. That's the that's kind of where where I'm where, where I'm heading, where I'm going. So catechesis then takes uh, focuses primarily on symbolics, which run which is a subset of aesthetics. It's not trying to account for the catechetical role of aesthetics as a whole. Right, yes. But, but I did not art articulate that the way that I wanted to. Divine beauty flows from Christ doctrine. Does anybody know what those things are? They are host dispensers, yeah. so that you can shoot from the hip, yeah. <laughs> right from the altar. You can open no, I'm not, no, that's, ex that's literally what they are. They are, you, they, they click, and so that you don't have to touch the host. Because they don't want any of your, your dirty germs. <laughs> yeah. Now, what does that lose? A, a sensory perception. And, and, and you know what else? You, you, you lose a sensory perception by receiving the host in your hand as well. However, I am not saying that that's a negative step, but to have it placed on your tongue is a different experience than having it placed in your hand. Now, having it shot in, into your mouth like you're at OK Corral Lutheran Church <laughs> is a whole different issue. Obviously, this is not good practice. In, in my opinion, there's nothing beautiful about this. Uh, in fact, it takes away from the divinity of what we, what, we, what we understand as Christ in the supper and what, what do we end up focusing on? The cool technology. Right. And so, and so my, my, my point is divine beauty, that is where their baptism, the Lord's Supper, holy absolution. That is what I would call divine beauty because it's tied directly to the truth. There is nothing outside of the word. What is the bread? Bread. Bread. Outside of the water or outside of the word, what is the water? water. And so the divine beauty all comes from scripture. It comes from the actual word. And we're going to get to the verba here in just a second. I'm going to move on from this. Okay, now I'm going to take you through the, the, the sense of smell here very quickly because, well we're, well, we're going to start off with the olfactory senses. Okay, so we're going to look at smell and taste together. The use of incense. The sense of smell does not mean incense. You do not have to use incense in order to stimulate the sense of smell. It's just the most common way of, of doing so. Uh, and everybody points to uh, the Old Testament re regarding incense and also the New Testament as well. Uh, but you can also, and everybody knows it when they smell it, right? I mean, like you said, you, you know it's frankincense right away. Not only um, frankincense, it was good frankincense. But also oils. If you use oil for anointing the sick, don't use olive oil unless you use olive oil as carrier oil. Make sure they can smell it, particularly if, if they are sick or they are dying. Make sure that they can smell the sign of the cross that you put on their forehead because it, it lasts. Now, I'm going to go back because I was, I, I was asked an odd question by uh, a member of mine when I was teaching uh, sensory perception at Augustana. And they said, well, okay, Pastor, what, what does uh, salvation smell like? Blood, blood dirt, blood. sweat. <laughs> Well, I, and, and, and it took me a second, and it's taken me even longer, even after, even though I answered the question. What does salvation smell like? And my answer was, it smells like baptismal water that's been in the font a little too long. Now, that, that, that answer was just was merely, you know, to, to, to point to baptism. But also, we could also make the argument for chrism and for holy oils. For every person that, that I visit who is dying, I anoint them with oil, usually of frankincense and myrrh together. And don't buy the stuff from uh, Lifeway. Don't buy the oil from Lifeway. 
as much as it's not currently still part of our tradition, as though it, but it should be. Um, many of us have been able to go to the Holy Land a few times, and, and any time you go into the ancient uh, cathedrals in that St. James or, or wherever, uh, the, the, the in, they're very specific. You, you know, when you go in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you smell it. Mm -hmm. You know, and so smells are all about associations. Right. And, and so that smell, when that oil comes to you and touches you, it should tie you to your altar to the forgiveness of sins. It smells like the forgiveness of sins. Exactly. Because it's completely associated with that word. Uh, it, exactly. Yeah. And, so, and so when someone's dying and, and, and you make the sign, and you, and you read, and we do have this now in the Pastoral Care Companion, and we read the, the, the James passage, and we make the sign of the cross with the oil, every time I, depending on how cognitive they are, or I guess how, well, what, how far are they along in the, in the process of dying? I'll either say or I'll lean into their ear and whisper, smell this as a reminder of your baptism and that neither death uh, nor life nor angels nor demons can take that away from you. So as you take your last breath, smell that you you know, smell and see that, that, that you have been saved. Um, not that it's a rebaptism by any means, but that it is a reminder. You know, it, it, it ties you to that font, uh, which is why I recommend using chrism. Yeah, I, I appreciate your discussion and all, but in eminent death, the sense of smell is the first to go. Okay. The sense of hearing is the last to go. Okay. What about those who are with the with, with the parishioners? I don't. I don't really see. I mean, I'm not going to not do it because. Right. Well, I understand. But I'm, just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying, with, with, as, with as, as, as with imminent death, the sense of smell is mm. the first to go. Right. And, the, and and you've all seen this when you talk to someone who is about to die. They don't necessarily open their eyes, but if you read and you know sing. They they react. Well, I, I also I, I don't come in for a for a bedside visit within the last moments either. I mean I've b right. been there for hours and if not if not days, you know. Yes, you you are you are correct. Uh, that 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 smell is the first to go, and hearing is the last to go. Though that's not 100% the case. We're, we're we're talking dying of old age or dying of illness. Holy oils, I, I highly recommend anointing of the sick and dying. Also, anointing of furniture and appointments. You do not have to do this during service. I don't do this during service. I do not make it a part of the liturgy because guess what? It's not a part of the liturgy. But I do oil my sanctuary furniture in chrism. Take a rag and I oil the baptismal font down, the pulpit down, the altar everything so that when they come in they smell that and I guarantee you when they're in on their deathbed the, then they smell that you don't have the you don't have the smoke right I mean isn't that the isn't that the, the, the real problem with incense right uh, this the smoke because I'll, I'll tell you a story a friend of mine he had been fighting about whether to do incense or not doing incense and by the way I'm a fan of incense there's even an incense called old church which is exactly what you what, what, what you were saying. You know, uh, it, it's it's meant to remind you of an old church, um, and it actually comes from Mount Athos, uh, frankincense. And everyone kept saying, or some people kept saying, "I'm allergic. I'm allergic. I'm allergic." Even though it had on the can hypoallergenic, it doesn't matter. Okay, they're they're still going to have allergies. They have allergies to the. Aller to the hypoallergenic sticker. This, this pastor that I knew said he just threw caution into the wind and smoked up the place. And all of a sudden people go <coughs> and they get up and they leave and everybody's mad. And after church they come up to him and they say, we thought you weren't gonna use incense because of our allergies. And the pastor goes, who would have thought dry ice would have, <laughs> would have affected your allergies so much? And they were like, ah. Uh. 
And so from then on, he was able to, to do. <laughs> also, do not use, the, if you're gonna use incense, do not use the cheap stuff. I buy my incense from Nevsky's Books, which is an Eastern Orthodox uh, little bookstore in the diocese of New Jersey. And, and they get it from Mount Athos. I mean, they, it literally comes from Mount Athos. Sense of taste. Now here we're going to, I love this piece of art right here. Um, I wish Christ's head was a little more proportional, but um, you, you get the idea. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful imagery. It's very Lutheran because it doesn't separate Christ from the grape. It doesn't transfigure, but it acknowledges that Christ's blood and the wine is there. However, I guarantee you that a Baptist would use this to argue that wine isn't necessary <laughs> because there's not enough time to ferment. Uh, Exodus here, regarding the taste, the sense of taste. We're we'll start with Exodus. The house of Israel named it Mammon, uh, and it was like coriander seed, white, and it taste was like wafers with honey. What if you add coriander seed to a beer, what beer it makes? Gose, sour beers, sour beers. And so it, you actually see the, the description of what the manna tasted like. Yeah, you, can, you can actually see it from scripture, the truth of what manna tasted like. Now, why would that description be in scripture? Let's go to the next one, into the New Testament. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who drew the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom. What I love regarding this is, it's very much, it's very uh, Simeon to me. He tasted the, the wine and called upon the bridegroom, which we do in the mass. And particularly in this next one, Genesis and prepared a, sav a savory dish, and prepare a savory dish for me as I, as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, so that my soul may bless you before I die. What, where are we here? This is uh, Abraham, and uh, he thought he was talking Esau. to Esau, but he was actually talking to his younger son, right. who had, who had uh, basically deceived him. Right. Not, not, yeah, not, yeah, not basically, I mean, Totally. totally. Yeah, to totally. I mean, uh, you know, but, but the, the hairy arms. You know, yeah. I'm trying to, to exercise the, even the Eighth Commandment here, all right? So basically. <laughs> Fair enough. But see, this is also very Simeon to me, even though, you know, t the betrayal was not uh, Abraham's. Prepare a savory dish for me, such I love, and bring it to me that I may eat so that my soul may bless you before I die. We could say that in place of the Nuke Dimittis. I'm not recommending it, I'm just saying that this is, the, this is the same thing. Let me taste and see that the Lord is good and, may let me, and that I may depart in peace. Now, the reason I do not recommend re replacing this with Simeon is because the Nuke Dimittis is way better and more clear about, you know, he's actually holding the Christ child in which we do so in communion. Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word, for mine eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all people, or the Gentiles, whichever, however you want to uh, translate. Uh, and of course, the psalm here, all taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. I'll taste and see that the Lord is good. What is David talking about? Provision. And what provision do we understand as Christians in the taste? And yes, we're going to go here. Dear professor, I hope you will not argue with me too much on this one, because I do find John 6 sacramental. I also find it as faith, but it's sacramental. If you read this to a child, the child would say, oh, it means you have to eat Jesus' body and blood and be a part, to be a part of him. And so here we have... You don't subscribe <laughs> to the confessions, do you? <laughs> What's that? I said you don't, you don't do quia subscription to the confessions, is that... I do. I just, uh, I, I, I don't feel that... I mean, even Luther didn't, didn't uh, oh, yeah. deny the one, right? Stop grumbling amongst yourselves. <laughs> Jesus answered, 
No one comes to me uh, unless the Father who sent me draws them. I will raise them up on the last day. It is written in the prophets. Uh, uh, they will be taught, all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only the one, only he has seen the Father. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, the one who believes in me has eternal life. Now there we have, we're talking faith, right? We're talking, where, where Luther discusses faith. I don't deny that. I am the bread of life. I don't deny that that's faith either, but it's also sacramental. Your ancestors ate. I don't see, I don't see the point in, in distinguishing. That, that's what I'm saying. I don't, see, I, don't, I don't find it helpful to distinguish uh, the two. Well, it's not about communion, it's about faith. Don't we commune in faith and doesn't our faith grow as we eat uh, Christ's body and drink his blood? I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna, which tasted like goze beer in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You read that to a child, what is he going to say? That you must eat and drink the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood in order to have life in you. And we call that life faith. Again, I don't see the point in distinguishing. Whoever eats, eats my flesh remains in me, and I in them, uh, the one who feeds on me, will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. That's the Mass, the receiving of Christ's flesh and blood for the forgiveness of sins and to the salvation of our soul. Uh, the words of institution. I like this picture a lot because you can, you can see there what I call the, the liturgical line. You see this little cross? It's behind the, the Paschal candle. That's the baptismal font, the lid. And so from there, you have, the, you have the, the Paschal candle, baptismal font, word of God. We have the flesh that Christ gives us, the life of the world. And there we have the crucifixion. So what people see there is the merits poured out from the crucifix onto the altar. And that's where the symbolism ends. But it does remind us of the all availing sacrifice. And so when we have the words of institution here, we have our Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed, took bread and we had given thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. This cup is a New Testament in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Around that cross, it says in Latin, this is not, this translation from Latin is not terrific, I don't think, but it's quod pro vobos, and it says, this is for you, written in, in Latin around that. And so Christ there, crucified with the corpus on there, this is for you. And I can tell you how I got that into the church and, and how I implemented it, uh, but I don't think we're going to have the time now. This is Augustana at Lutheran Church. This is my church, my home. Again, I just want to point out our appointments here. We have the baptismal font obviously here. We have the chancel, and then the chancel becomes wood, and we understand the chancel to be the Holy of Holies, uh, where Christ is on the altar. Um, we have an eight-sided font. We have the rarados. Above the rarados, we have both the resurrected and ascending Jesus. And of course, here we have the processional crucifix along with the Paschal Lamb. What I taught and what you will look up and find on my YouTube page is that what I call the liturgical line. Baptismal font in the center, lined with the altar, eyes focused upon Christ as we enter into heaven. I taught this as the entire life of the Christian that we are brought into the faith by baptism. 
We are fed and kept alive at the altar. We are preached to and proclaimed to through God's holy word. And we have Christ crucified in which we die in and are brought into heaven. Uh, you've mentioned this liturgical line a couple of times. What, what is your thought about the um, reform, <clears throat> the, specifically the, the art of the, in the Reformation period by, by Lutherans in which the crucifix um, does not uh, put blood into the Eucharist or the sacramental vessels, but sprays directly upon the believer. You can see this in a variety of Kranich paintings. Oh, sure, um, sure. The, the uh, Weimar, right? It's in, it's, it's in the Weimar, it's in, the, it's in that uh, Law and Gospel uh, painting. Mm -hmm. um, it's even in the presentation of the Augsburg Confession where the, it's really quite interesting, the blood actually is, is arcing over, the Eucharist is being celebrated around the, the crucifix, but the blood of the crucifix is not going into the Eucharistic chalice, but it's flying over their heads and splashing on a child who's about to be baptized, uh, not going into the water. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's Paul, you know, that we're, we're baptized into, into Christ's death. Well, I know, but it's, it's specifically set in contrast to the Eucharistic vessels receiving the blood of Christ. In other words, it's not a priestly mediation of right. Christ's blood, but the direct relationship of the believer by faith being covered with the blood and, of Christ. And, yeah, and, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. Because on the one hand, and, and when I say the, the liturgical line, I'm talking about at Augustana. I'm not talking about um, that, that this is how it should be everywhere. I, this is just how I described it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That um, and and I'm offering this as a suggestion if if you want to do the you know if if you understand where I'm where I'm coming from, being brought into the ark of the church through baptism, fed from the altar, and from uh, the word. And then, um, and then brought into into heaven. We just happen to, fortunately, have an ascending Jesus. I think you had. Well, I was just wondering what the uh, American flag hovering over the lectern teaches. <laughs> <laughs> it, teach, it teaches. It teaches. It, it teaches wisdom. <laughs> because there are other things. How about, how about there are bigger fish <laughs> to fry. How about the Methodist flag? <laughs> the, Methodist one? Yeah. The, the Methodist, Methodist flag Methodist. teaches the same thing. <laughs> it, teach, it teaches patience, perseverance, and wisdom. <laughs> Practicality, you mean? Albert Durer's woodcuts of a uh, famous one of the angels holding the, the cups, cups is yeah. the three angels, right? It's 1510. Um, but specifically, Protestant art in the 16th century is quite intentional about, about moving a conveying over against the priestly mediation is, is the key, is the sacerdotal sacramental system is being argued against. I mean, and, what you're talking about and, is the and, seven sacraments painting. Yeah. Right. And, and, and Al Albrecht Drewer's uh, uh, 1510 collection, uh, the angels collected the, the blood, is, is, not a, is not a priestly confession. It's just, you know, it's, it's just um, imagery. You know, I mean, there, there's, there's no... Or, or other, other than Christ being the high priest, you know, there's no um, sacerdotal element to it. Or is that what you're saying? Oh, I'm saying that, that he's, he's pulling on a tradition in which the, the grace of the blood of Christ goes directly into the Eucharistic cup. And everyone knows that the Eucharistic cup, cup is held and dealt and handed out. Well, it's not even handed out, is it? It's just, it's just uh, uh, handled by the priest. That's the symbol. Unless you have one of those shooters. What? One of those. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but the chalice is the symbol of the priesthood. That's what they give the priest at ordination. So, um, you don't have to have a priest in the picture to know that there's no other option in 1510 to think about the way in which grace is mediated. And the reformers right. are actually trying to argue a different, a different angle. Crucifix on our altar. The corpus makes the crucifix. An empty cross does, does not uh, have a set point in time. How do I know this? Because for everyone who says we worship a risen Lord, which is why we don't have a corpus on the cross, for every person who says that assumes that Christ had already been crucified, but there's no set point in time. What if the cross is empty because He's in, the, he's in the manger, or the cross is empty because he's 
in the upper room. There's no point of reference that, that he has been crucified at all yet. You could take that as a symbol of not being saved yet. You know, that Christ has not been crucified. In fact, I make the argument, where's the holes and where's the blood? If we're going to talk about the empty cross being a symbol of the resurrection, I need identifying marks. No, worst, worst of all is that it is a symbol of, of the time period between when Christ was, uh, um, was taken down from the cross and when he, and when he was resurrected on, on East, Easter Sunday. It, it symbolizes Wasn't that a coincidence? God. It, no, that's he's, what, preaching to, he's preaching to those who need to hear the word. It's a, it's a symbol of dead God. Right. For that time period. Right. So th th that's the most horrific uh, symbol of all. Right. To me, this could easily represent Christ was busy calling the disciples and has not even ventured to Golgotha yet. Now the corpus, you put the corpus on there, then you have a set fixed point in time when Christ was crucified. So the argument that an empty cross represents a resurrected Jesus Unless you, can, unless you have the indicators of a savior being nailed to the cross, it's just not true. And if you want to wear something that represents the resurrected Christ, no one's stopping you from wearing an empty tomb around your neck, right? Yeah. So let's, let, let, let's be honest. The crucifixion reminds us of our salvation. The empty tomb reminds us of the hope we have in Christ alive. A corpus on the cross, again, gives us a fixed point in time. Um, also, if you'll, you'll notice, and, you, and you, this does uh, matter, especially when you teach your people, there is such a thing as a living Jesus, a dying Jesus, and a dead Jesus on the cross. We sort of assume that every Jesus on the cross is a dead Jesus, but that's not true. What's the distinguishing thing that makes Jesus a living Jesus versus a dead Jesus in, in art. Uh, the in, wound on his side. The wound on his side. So wherever you find that, the price has been paid. And from that wound came what? His bride, the church. May I ask a question? No. <laughs> now go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering what your take would be on more of a symbolic uh, crucifix rather than, not a bear cross, but a symbolic crucifix. Specifically, I'm thinking of the church I grew up in, and I'm not, don't worry about that part. It's, I'm asking about the artwork in your thoughts. It, it, was, it was a pierced lamb who was obviously slain, holding the shepherd's staff of, a, of Jesus very nicely done. And it was obviously a crucifix. It was obviously Jesus up there through the meaning of what we understand as the Lamb of God on, the, on, on his cross. I would wonder what you'd think about that. Done nicely and appropriately. Well, we just think about a symbolic type of thing like that. It's a, it's a crossover. It's usually the Lamb of God on the Book of Life with the seven uh, seals. Right. Uh, the the, the, the uh, motif is usually with the, with the wound and the chalice underneath catching the blood. Right. Except we take that off of that particular uh, of the Book of Life and you put it on, on, on transpose it with a cross is what he's talking about. Me, I got no problem with it. It's still I, Jesus. I, I, I don't have, I don't, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's, it's a variation. I, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, variation. I, don't, I don't find a problem with it either. This is our, this is our processional crucifix. Um, and you can very well see here uh, the, the wound in, uh, in, in his side. Uh, this processional crucifix came from Rome. It's beautiful. It's at least six and a half feet tall on, from, on the ground. When that thing goes during the procession, I mean, you can't not notice it. It is just there. Christ crucified for you. Uh, this is just the back of the church, uh, Augustana. We have the uh, Crinox altarpiece. This was, th these three here are made into a piece of art. But this, what child is this who lays to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, is in the middle and it has those two juxtaposed uh, together. Has anyone seen that? What I did was I took these two po posters. I had this made, what child is this who laid to rest? And I had it 
put in the in the middle and it was into one piece of art and I ended up using it for postcards and things like that. Has anyone seen it? Usually it pops up on Facebook around Advent time. Everything is catechetical. It's either poorly catechized or catechized well. This is my son, Oliver, my wife, Ashley. That's me. Guess what's happening? There's a big clue. Photobomb. <laughs> True. Well, I'm baptizing my son, Oliver. But this is what we don't think about and why we need to incorporate good practice. Because do you see this child, I wasn't thinking about him. I was thinking about this child and that water. And yet there he is being catechized properly by seeing that sacrament. And he is look, I mean, he is watching. And so the liturgy is also catechetical. And also why it's important to have good practice. An aesthetical case study. It's just a random LCMS church. What does this sanctuary teach? What could we teach the, the members of St. Paul? What would you teach? The altar is in the center. It is in the center because this is where the presence of God is promised to be. Um, on, the, on the right side, or, or at least our right side, is the baptismal font. And we know that the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove is descending upon, mm -hmm. is, a, is, is de descending as he did at, upon Christ at the baptism in the Jordan River, so also he does for us when we are baptized in, um, in obedience to the command of Christ, be ye baptized also. That is, that's wonderful. As you teach the Holy Spirit coming down in baptism, so also you remind them that the, that the Holy Spirit is here in the baptismal font, right? So anytime that text come up, comes up, you, you can say, like in our sanctuary where the Holy Spirit is descending on the font. This, this has been designed by our church fathers for that particular purpose. There's nothing that I made up. You know the same truth. Everybody else here knows the same truth. Okay. Yeah. And, yes, uh, you're right. And uh, that, that is part of the aesthetic that becomes catechetical, right? It, yes. Okay, that's, what you, that's, that's one of your main theses, and you're yes. right on, on that. And I, I don't well, have thank to you. disagree with that. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I, I want to just emphasize what you're talking about. When we engage in sacramental acts, it is also catechetical, and you had the, uh, the child in amazement looking at this being done as it was done to him. And he's hopefully going to be reminded of that by his parents and his pastor and his grandparents. You, that was you when, before you were aware of it. Right. Um, exactly. And that's the point. Yeah, that, yeah. I'll, I'll also tell you that, um, in my own experience, the children who, are, who come to the, to the altar rail to be blessed because they're still too young to receive uh, the body and blood of our Lord have already memorized a large portion, a large swaths of the, of the liturgy. And I can see them uh, mouthing it as, as, uh, as I am, as, like the, uh, the words of institution, the ver uh, verba. Yeah. yeah, the verum. They are mouthing it because they have seen it so often that, they, that the words are entering into their ears right. and into their um, minds. Uh, Hopefully, uh, from there, it'll descend to their soul. Right. Uh, also, it's a practice of mine. For those who are too young to uh, commune, I hold the patent in front of them and ask them who and what it is. And they say, the body of Christ. And I say, amen. And I do the same thing with the blood. Who and what is this? This is the, the blood of Christ. Amen. Every, every time. Every, I do it to my son, who's a year old. I do it to uh, newborns. Of course, answer for them. They are the only two steps away from being able to receive it themselves. Then. Uh, uh, yeah, I yeah. know. <laughs> that's a different, that, 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 that's yeah, a different it, discussion it is, for a different is. time. Uh, quickly. And, and the, aesthetics for the, you're talking about little kids' aesthetics, you know. I had a family come in with like a, a two-year-old. They didn't go to church really, but they wanted their kid baptized. Great. Snuck out in the middle of the service, ran right up to the altar. What a beautiful thing. They knew that was special. Right. They didn't know why. They didn't have a clue why, but they knew it was special. But to continue with St. Paul here, St. Paul is not in the round. Most people would think. 
it's actually three-sided. Because the, the first thing I did when I got here, I went into the sanctuary and I looked around at what could be taught. That is one thing that could be taught. They're, they're sitting, they, they have been called together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, uh, gathered together in their baptism. And the building itself teaches that they have been gathered in that triangle. And you can even point to the doxological points in the in hymnody, for example. Also, regarding the altar, so I'm just going to tell you, since we're kind of running out of time, the altar uh, is not only on the, in the center, but it is elevated, which is sac sacramentally not unimportant. Having that altar elevated and being in the center is a visual confession of what we believe according to Christ, what we believe according to his body and his blood, but also the stone. I would teach Golgotha. You can see the stone, obviously the, the slate here, but the stone underneath the altar. The pulpit is huge. It's, it's unmistakable. And you put a preacher in there, they're gonna know that someone's preaching implies that we care about preaching and we believe that preaching actually does something, that it does not return void. That pulpit screams that. The processional crucifix has a corpus. Uh, the altar cru uh, crucifix obviously has a corpus. I would also, I highly recommend teaching the this church in particular as, as an inverted arc, the first obvious things, as, as an inverted arc. Um, and then, and that's just the, the sight of it. Then we enter into the smell. I would oil the altar rail with anointing oil. I just put, you know, I attended this church for many years and I just now noticed you have the large central cross and the two smaller crosses yeah, on either side. I just noticed that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd never noticed that before. It's Golgotha. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're not, you're not gonna walk into St. Paul and, and go, did you, did, did you see a cross? No, but there you specifically, <laughs> you specifically see Golgotha there. You yeah. see Good Friday. Oh, oh yeah. It'd be ideal to have a corpus on the central on cross. The central but cross, yeah. absolutely. And then, and then, and then, as, as the stained glass rises up, you see the the Spiritus glad, Gladius. It's, this is an easy church to teach to teach the people. But have you, as pastors, walked into your sanctuary and looked around and thought, how can this be taught? And then you bring it up all the time. You never let them forget it because they believe rightly, this is their home. They're attached to this church. They love this place. They believe that Christ is truly present and they come and they receive it. And just like your own home, and when you decorate it, you decorate it according to purpose and functionality and beauty, etc. For example, one of my friends, he has like a hundred icons on his wall. And to me, I can't concentrate on anything. Too much, it's just too much stuff. And that can easily be done. This particular sanctuary, it would be very difficult to crowd because of the, the triangle, the Trinitarian shape that, it, that it's in. In my book here, Beauty and Catechesis, I have a section where I teach from pieces of, of art, little, little devotions, and particularly on this one. This is William Blake's watercolor, Milton's Paradise Lost. What do you see? We, we know from context what, who, uh, who the who the two human beings are, and the, and uh, what the, who the snake is, what tree that is, um, and then and what book of the Bible it's from, uh, and what chapter. In fact, it's chapter three, Genesis. Uh, I'll also point out that this, his head is draconian, which points to Revelation as well, but it also shows us the first sin, and this is what we talked about the the other day. What was the first sin? What are your people? What would your people say if they saw this? Eating the apple. Uh, eating the apple. Eating the apple. Right. Yeah. But well, and also, and also, Eve wasn't the first to sin. That's false. That's what people think. Now look at Adam. There's your first sin. He's not watching over his wife being seduced by the dragon. Adam neglected his husbandly duties, and that was the first sin. By, by neglecting his husbandly duties, he made himself the idol. He was off doing his own thing, right? Now, I'm not, now ladies, I'm not letting you off the hook necessarily because uh, you can see, and, I, and this is what I love about Paradise Lost is, is that, that kiss of death there. Eve is almost hugging him as she would. Oh yeah, it, it's, it's very sensual. It's very sensual. And, and how is Satan described throughout scripture? Many times he, as beautiful. 
but she she's holding on to him as as though he he were her husband. Right. As, exactly. As her husband for sex. And smooching him. Now here are two examples of just art. I want you to tell me what you see. And since we're since we're in we're almost out of time. We are out of time. Let's just stick with this one. Does anyone know who this does anyone know who the artist is? Chronic? It is chronic. This is, this is probably my favorite piece of artwork. I have it framed in my office. What's going on? Uh, young Saint John the Baptizer pointing to Jesus as he would in the future. Behold the Lamb of God, and then you have the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world by the cross that he is holding. He's stepping upon the Satan who is, uh, who is wounding his heel as was prophesied in Genesis, and he overcomes death as he steps upon the skull. Historically known as Adam. Yeah, he's historically known as Adam. Or death, depending on, on, on the context. But yeah. Anything else? You see the lamb, but do you see John the Baptist's hand as well? Well, no, 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 no. His left hand. On top of the, it's on the lamb's head. It's on the lamb's head. Okay. Anything else? Oh, the hands of blessing. Okay. Hands in blessing. Why is Jesus naked and John not? Well, naked I, I, on the cross, I think I think the better question is uh, is he's wearing camel's hair. Camel's hair. That's that's the. Would. But that's but it's a good question. The, the Last Supper painting um, is one sided. Why are they all gathered on one side of the table? Not for the picture. <laughs> that's the that's the joke. Everybody did. Does anyone know why? What's that? To invite the viewer to be part. It breaks the fourth wall, right? The, 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 it's empty because you are the one who is invited. You are, the, you are on that side of the table. The same thing's happening here. Tell me where. John's, John's looking, looking at us. John the Baptist is looking at you saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And thank goodness the ladies just walked in for me to point out this part, the one that no one ever wants to say. Why is Jesus' testicle vis visible? <laughs> You're welcome. You sure it was good timing? <laughs> I'm thinking it wasn't. The seed of Adam? I, I wasn't going to take it there, but um, why? I mean, sincerely, it's 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 obviously there. Obviously, it's just to show that he's male. Incarnation, fully fully human. It, it it shows it's the incarnational nature of of Christ. Once you learn that God had a penis, we, you understand the incarnation. But nobody, nobody likes to think about that, right? Because every crucifix has that loincloth just perfectly. No. Um, Michelangelo carved Okay, I'm one. not saying that every single cross has it. I'm just saying the majority. Um, what do we have here? The transfiguration. And who all do we have? Extra human beings. Uh, Peter, James, John, Christ, uh, Elijah, Moses, some... some uh, some, I guess, is Dominican friar and and uh, and uh, the and the Theotokos. Yep, the Theotokos. Uh, this is Fra Angelico. He painted himself into it. Ah, okay. Um, was he was he Dominican? I don't know what country he was from. <laughs> <laughs> this is from my book, uh, God Loves Me Such. Children know and understand art. They know pictures, they know what's happening in them, uh, and so I highly recommend you use them. And also I highly recommend that while this, it, while this is a children's book, you not make Christ look like a cartoon. It's the worst thing you can do. Because when you make Christ look like a cartoon, and when you, and when you hide the crucifixion from them, Christ becomes Santa. It's just the fact of the matter. Ed and I, Ed Riojas and I decided that we were not going to do that when, when, we, when uh, we wrote this book. That Christ was going to be actually crucified and that he would not just be a cartoon. Of course, I highly recommend these books. <laughs> um, but children do know art and uh, good catechesis and good art will teach them quicker than bad art. Also coming soon, Little ABC, my little ABC liturgy coloring book uh, for your for your pews.
Also, I've been asked by KFUO to, doubt, to create six episodes for podcast, all on catechetical uh, aesthetics and art and scripture and using hymnody and using any medium of art to teach. And of course, we're starting with creation and Michelangelo and, uh, and I end up moving along. But it's, it's, and it's called a piece of work. Here's the deal though, and this is where I want, need your help. The podcast is coming as they're redoing everything, but the reason it's coming as a podcast is because they need to count the number of downloads so, so to make it measurable. Um, if, if it's successful, it will go into KFU proper, and I'll, and I'll be on there every week um, teaching scripture and different areas of art, including hymnody, uh, the conf confessions, scripture, um, etc. And I believe that that is it.